Chapter 20. Savoy House. The home of Sir Henry and Lady Lee, in which an object of importance is discovered, and a winning is remembered. And this window, so rare, so clear, Mistress Constance, can you not see perfectly how the sun shines on the river? Where have you ever seen such a fine glass? You, as a lady, you, indeed, have seen it at Whitehall, of course, because it is a gift from Her Majesty, bestowed on me for my gallant service at Berwick. Sir Henry Lee pressed himself against the window, stroking it with satisfaction. Look, mistress, at the perfect situation of my home. Here is the river. I have my own water stairs, to be sure, and the Queen's palace is but a stone's throw. Regard my garden. You can see it from this window. My orchard is not quite as fine as that at Whitehall, but I flatter myself that my apple trees are not much less elegant. Sir Henry turned away from the window to a table and took up a book. The cover red leather, lettered in leaf, and a fat purple jewel in the middle. This Seneca, a copy non parallel, is from France, given me on my ambassadorial visit for mon service formidable à la roi. Sir Henry Lee's French had a spitty flourish that broke Constance out of her stupor. She examined the book obligingly, her lips forming the same compliment she had spoken about the plate from Italy, the turkey carpet, the drapes from Antwerp. This timepiece originated in Habsburg. It is indeed a marvel. Sir Henry picked up a golden clock with a pointed spire. The hours are displayed by three means. French who measure the days as we do, Italian beginning at sundown and Nuremberg, daylight and night hours. Note this. He stuck the weapon-like timepiece in her face, a hair's breadth from her nose, and Constance flinched in spite of herself, hands showing the day of the week and the month of the year, on the back an astrolobe showing the motions of the stars, and here hands for the positions of the sun and the moon in the zodiac, and the phases and ages of the moon. Sir Henry Lee was in full exultation of his home, of his life at the height of royal favour as Elizabeth's champion. His wife, Charles Paget's elder sister, had insisted on Constance's visit so that she could prod her like a cow, assessing her fitness as a bride. Constance had taken this invitation as a good omen for her marriage with Charles Paget. Henry Lee might say a kind word for her with the Queen and smooth the path. Constance had written Aunt Stoner of the visit and assured her that she would strive to make the best of impressions. But now her patience was wearing, as Lady Lee failed to appear, and her host's voice droned on. Sir Henry was considered well put together by many of the court ladies, but he left Constance cold. This beautiful desk, look at it, mistress. We have moved from the clock. As fine as it is, I have finished with the clock. Turn your attention here, if you please. Can you guess where this might have come from? Constance summoned the energy to be ever polite. Dear me, such beauty. The angels made it, I believe. Angels! Ha, ha, ha! How pleasant! No, no, not angels. Spaniards, it is a vaguenu. The poet Wyatt brought it back. He was a well-travelled ambassador. My mother was his sister. He was an excellent correspondent. They were never long out of communication. How charming! Constance was amazed. Henry Lee, Wyatt's nephew? Trying to keep her voice steady, she said, How your mother must have enjoyed reading aloud Wyatt's letters from his travels. Indeed, indeed, and they were exquisite correspondence. But many she kept for herself, and regretfully did not share the contents with my siblings and I. That was the nature of my mother and mon oncle. Wyatt's desk. Constance wanted to go to it, to touch it. But Sir Henry drew her through the rooms, dropping names and telling tales of those who could lay their success at his feet. Pretending close examination of a painting of Christ carrying the cross, a gift from the Marquis de Feria, Constance meditated on the possibilities. Could there be letters hidden in one of those drawers? False bottoms, false backs, secret nooks? 
Were those not commonplace in an ambassador's desk? Letters between dear sister and her brother that might lead to the relic? Sir Henry coerced her to admire a carved oak bench, a gift from the young King Edward Tudor just before his last bloody cough, whose comfort she was obliged to test with a quick recline. Constance wondered how she could possibly manage a moment alone to search the desk. Sir Charles Paget was announced, and Constance witnessed Sir Henry's unpleasant smirk as he sent her off to his wife's chambers. Charles stood aside judiciously, as Lady Lee, a female version of her brother, standing a head taller than most ladies, looking the matriarch with a biggin-clad baby in her lap, pried into Constance's irreproachable past. Charles's mouth turned up in a smile at Constance's mild replies to interrogation. Lady Lee's judgment of her was unclear, yet Charles seemed content as he escorted her back to Bedford House. "'Your aspect is of gravitas. You are deep,' he admired. Constance glowed. "'It was kind of you to come, sir. My sister can be a terror, yet I see in you a unity that allows poise under any conditions.' Charles was always ready to see a good quality in her, Constance thought. He was not as lively as some courtiers, but then he was devout, and devotion might swallow up wit. He asked her if he could present her with a token. It was a brooch, a small green stone flecked with bright red in a silver setting. She was delighted by it. She pinned it into her snood. The bloodstone is a wondrous jewel, formed long ago when the sacred blood of Christ fell and dried onto the earth and became solid. It looks most beautiful in your dark hair, mistress. The blood of Christ to adorn her hair. It was not a frothy jewel, Constance thought. How this Charles loved meaning. She experienced a connection to Charles. She imagined how astounded he would be if she were to find Sir Thomas More's relic. Charles was a person of such feeling. They arrived at Bedford House, and as Charles took his leave of her, she felt a twinge. She watched him disappear. Then, sure, Princess Cecilia was busy away from home, outraging someone. Constance's thoughts bent on the relic. She set out abruptly from the house in the direction of Cheapside. Wynne moaned and cried behind her, saying that her feet throbbed. Philomena was engrossed in every detail Constance related. It is a sideways tie that you shall marry the brother of Wyatt's sister's son's wife. She burst out laughing. I will soon be Wyatt's daughter, Philomena asked. The desk has caught your fancy. You can imagine, Philomena. Sir Henry runs on about things and then says I have the poet's desk. I wanted to leap over and search it through and through. Do you not think it may harbour secrets? Without question. Are there desks of men of power that do not? It will be difficult to return to the house. Is not the time-honoured way to bribe the servants? Yet, if I were discovered, how would I explain being there? True. What of your sister-in-law to be? Perhaps we could bring a token for the baby. The proud mother will take you off to the nursery. I will feign a malady and stay behind to search. I would not have you take the risk. I shall do it. Lady Lee will not abandon you, Constance. She will fuss over you. Yet she will leave me, and I will search the desk. I must do it, Constance insisted. It is my quest, and I would not have you cause trouble for yourself, dear Philomena. You have done much already. I do not wish you danger in the house of Sir Henry Lee. I do not fear him. Shall we duel over it? I claim this quest for myself as well. Philomena leapt to her feet and held forth an imaginary sword. Or must I die on my own sword? Philomena took the weapon made of air and jabbed her heart, gurgling. Halt! Halt the carnage! cried Constance, laughing. You are too accustomed to your own way, Philomena. As only a rich merchant's daughter can be. You must frown and look at me seriously, Philomena. This ring, even the relic of Sir Thomas More, it cannot be worth the risk. Henry Lee would throw you in jail. Your business would be lost, and I would stand as guilty party. I cannot have it. You would let an ass like Henry Lee stand in your way, or would you go without me? In truth, Constance confessed, I cannot cease this hunt. It is beyond reason. If you may hide behind unreasonableness, so shall I. I will go with you, even if you would not have me. I would regret it for ever if I did not lend some hand in finding this goodly jewel. Do not deny me, Philomena begged. You wrong me. I would ever have you in the chase, Constance admitted. It is the greatest enthrallment, and you are such a mule. I will never rid myself of you, even if I desired. 
Very well, then, it is settled, and may the heavens bless our enterprise. Now, Philomena said, what pains should strike me to divert Lady Lee? It must not be an illness. Lady Lee would blame me for ever for bringing you into the house, and would have a host of groomsmen throw you out. A fit of melancholia would do, Philomena said. I have recent concerns of a serious nature. Constance was a bit surprised that her friend could be so saucy about her mother's illness, but Philomena's ways were her own. You have a reverentia, Constance laughed, as does my mother, and I thank her for it. But this desk, Philomena, it has many drawers. It will take some time to go through them all. What type of desk is it? He called it a vergino, or, or something of that description. Spanish, rather like a, a chest on high legs. A vergueno. I have one, though surely of lesser craftsmanship than the great Sir Henry's. Philomena's desk was a good replica. Constance began opening everything quickly, as if in rehearsal. But Philomena pulled out one of the large bottom drawers, saying, Look, it lacks depth. It has a hiding place. Constance took it in her hands and felt all sides as she ran her fingers along the inside of the drawer and pulled out the false bottom. I am very pleased with myself, she said. As you should be. I expect these secret places are where our treasures may be found. I have heard of such things, said Constance. It was my thought the second I saw it. What shall we bring the baby? asked Philomena. I am owned a piece of blackwork lace, one in a card game from Bridget Skipworth. A trip to court will procure it. Are not each off to forward our secrets? Our Catholic wine cellar will come to meet me, Philomena said. I think your task the finer. Bridget Skipworth shall not bless but only curse me. Philomena had the tower escort Constance through Cheapside to the water stairs at Trig Lane. Wynne traipsed behind both, making little sounds as if she had been pricked by a pin. Oomp, ee, oomp, ee, every few steps. It was reassuring to have a shadow as big as a mountain at her side, Constance thought. The tower's long stride a strange comfort, not to mention the bargeman treated her unusually civilly. She would have tipped the tower, but she knew he would think it unkind. As she held his hand to climb into the boat, Constance wondered if it was Philomena's mother who inspired such loyalty, or was it simply the young man, born to swear himself to a master? As the barge moved into the river, she turned back to see the tower surrounded by a group of rowdy, strapling youths. They seemed to know him. Laughing, they pulled at him and gestured at a tavern. She was not a bit surprised when, a moment later, he pulled himself away and continued back up the street to the inn.